So, number one, when we're supposed to factor, when the directions say factor, the first thing I'm looking for is, if it says factor, first thing I look for is, what does x squared look like? Does it have a number in front of it or not? If it does, we got to deal with it one way. If it doesn't, we got to deal with it a different way. When it doesn't, such as in number one here, that's the easiest factoring problem possible. We're looking for the magic numbers that multiply to make negative 18. Negative 9 times positive 2 makes negative 18. The same two numbers add to make negative 7. So I'm multiplying to make this number. I'm adding to make that number. The same two numbers must do both things. If you can just see that right up by looking at it and see it, write it down like that, that's fine. If you're struggling to find that magic pair of numbers, you can just do a quick guess and check chart. We know what we want to happen. We want factors of negative 18. We want the sum to be negative 7. If I'm trying to find numbers multiply to make a negative number, one has to be positive, one has to be negative. If I want the sum to be negative, I need the bigger number negative. So when I start my list, I'm going to go positive 1 times negative 18. Just 1 times 18 obviously is 18, right? I always start with 1 times the number. And again, just look at if I'm adding those together, 18 negative in order to make the sum negative. 1 plus negative 18 is negative 17. That's not the right pair. 2 is next. Just count your way up. 1, we did it. 2, 2 times negative 9, negative 7, there it is right away. All right. If you kept on, if that wasn't the number, maybe go one more. 3 times what? Negative 6, that makes negative 3. 4 doesn't go into 18. 5 doesn't go into 18. 6 does, we've already got that one, so there's the whole list. So if you just work your way up, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, then you will get the whole list. All right. So either you just can see what it is and you've got it ready to go, or you can't see what it is, make a little chart, and you find, again, every one of these things does that. Make that happen, and then check and see which one gets the right sum, and there's your right pair of numbers. So once you get your right pair of numbers, we factor it by writing the first letter, whatever X, and this is X in this case. We've done X in every one of these problems. We'll put X on the test, too. I'm not going to try and weird it up by throwing different letters at you. So X, it'll be minus 9, and then parentheses X plus 2. They're always multiplied. Parentheses 1 times parentheses 2 when you write factored forms. All right, so once you find those magic numbers, that's how you write the answer. If you want to understand this a little further, let me explain to you why this is the factored form, because sometimes people don't understand why things happen. If I was multiplying this out, I'd use FOIL, right? Well, first times first, x times x makes that x squared term. And the outer, outside product of positive 2x and the inside product of negative 9x is positive 2x and negative 9x, right? Those add up to make negative 7x. Notice it's just the two numbers we found, 2 and negative 9, with x's attached to them. So 2x, negative 9x. So we're adding those numbers to get that middle term because that's what we're, doing, we're multiplying it out. And when we do last times last, negative 9 times 2, that makes negative 18. That's just the last times last. We're multiplying to get that. We're just reverse foiling is what we're doing there. But again, we just need the pair of numbers that both multiplies and adds to make those two numbers. If you find it, there's your answer. This is what you write as your final answer. Don't multiply it back out. All right? Number two, also a factoring problem. So again, I see the word factor. As soon as I see factor as my directions, I then look at my x squared term. If there's a number in front of x squared, I look to see if I can factor it out. Is there, does 5 divide everything evenly? 5 divided by 5 is 1, 11 divided by 5 doesn't divide evenly, so we can't take 5 out. Okay, so that's, that's a fail on that, so we can't do it that way. So, when we have a number and we can't make it go away, because making it go away is better if we can, we're going to make that, that guess and check chart again. We want factors of, now the number we're going to find factors of is not negative 12. It's negative 12 times 5. You're going to multiply this number and this number. Signs matter. So positive 5 times negative 12 makes negative 60. All right. And again, this is only if there's a number in front of x squared. If 
there's no number in front of X squared. Do it like the first one. It's supposed to be easy. Okay? Hopefully it's easy for you. The sum of factors is still going to be this number here. So sum of factors is positive 11. <coughs> so again, this is a guess and check chart. 1 times what makes 60, 2 times what makes 60, 3 times what makes 60, and so on. We want a negative 60, so we need to have opposite signs. We want a positive sum, so bigger number positive this time. So again, 1 and 60 make positive 60. I need one of them to be negative, and I want, when I add them together, I get a positive answer. So opposite signs create the negative product. The smaller number of negative creates a positive sum. And when you add algebraically and the signs don't match, you subtract the number. So I, I keep saying add, but I'm adding algebraically. Signs are different, I subtract. Okay. Uh, next number up is 2. And obviously we want positive 11, that positive 59 isn't that, so we keep going. Po negative 2 times positive 30 makes negative 60. That adds up to positive 28. Negative 3 times positive 20 makes positive 17 if we add them up. Negative 4 times positive 15 makes negative 60. Add them up, you get positive 11, and there's our pair of numbers. Again, try 1, try 2, try 3, try 4. If these calculations are a little bit more complicated than you like, if the numbers get to be too large, grab a calculator. 60 divided by 4 equals, it will spit out 15. 60 divided by 5 equals, it will spit out 12. All right. If it spits out a decimal, it doesn't divide evenly, skip it. 60 divided by 7 doesn't divide evenly, skip it. 60 divided by 8 doesn't divide evenly, skip it, and so on and so forth. Right? But if, if you start at 1, then 2, then 3, you'll get every pair possible, and you'll look for the pair that makes the right sum. What we do with that pair of numbers is we're going to recreate this one term into two terms with these coefficients. So I'm going to rewrite the problem. I'm going to write 5x squared. I'm going to write minus 12. Those two things don't change. And this guy here, plus 11x, I'm going to change it into minus 4x plus 15x. That's what that chart's for, to find that exact breakdown of that middle term. That's the only breakdown of the middle term that will factor this thing correctly. Notice if I look at the blue and... Yes? I put my 15 in front of the 4. Is that okay? Uh, it's okay, um, but when I'm looking at this problem here, and it's, it's got four terms, term 1, 2, 3, 4. <coughs> if the third term is positive, it's easier. Oh, so it's, right. it's better to have the 15 in the third slot. It's not wrong to do it the way you did it. You see, you have an extra thing to consider. If, if you get a minus in that third slot, you've got to do some sign changing over here that sometimes messes people up. So I try to right. avoid that scenario. All right? And I'll make it on the test so there's a possibility of a plus, so you don't have to worry about that minus if you don't want to. Okay. All right. So that would be the only problem with it. Again, you're allowed to. The order doesn't matter really, but that third position term being positive does make it easier. So it's worth doing it this way. All right, so I want you to recognize this expression I've got here is equivalent. 5x squared is still 5x squared, minus 12 is still minus 12, negative 4x plus 15x makes positive 11x. It's exactly the same expression, I've just modified it into the structure that factor by grouping is going to work on. So I'm going to group the first two, and I'm going to group the second two with the plus sign staying in between the groups. And unless you're going back to your, or, sorry, yeah, unless you're going back to your expression, or your question, if that happened to be a minus sign on yours, you'd have to change that to an opposite sign then to account for that minus sign being there. So, and again, that, it's not that big a deal, but again, that's one extra thing to deal with, a chance of messing up, so I try to avoid it. So, once I make my two groups, I've got my black group and my green group, I'm looking for what object, number, letter, whatever is common to these two things. And x is common to these two terms only. 5 and 4 have no common numerical factors. So x is the greatest common factor of these two terms. I take x out of 5x squared, I get 5x. I get x out of negative 4x, I get minus 4. Okay. Whatever is common, take it out. What's left over should have nothing in common. This has an x, that doesn't. 5 and 4 have no common factors, so that's as much as I can do to that one. Then, I take the second group, looking at these two objects, what goes into both 15 and 12? 3. 3. So I'm going to take a positive, and plus is just part of the problem, I take a 3 out, and 15x divided by 3 is positive 5x, 12 divided by 3 is going to be minus 4. And what should happen, if you do it correctly, is 
this expression here in parentheses and this expression here in parentheses should be identical to each other. And if you did everything the way I showed you how to do it, that will happen. If it didn't happen, chances are you didn't take out the greatest common factor. Maybe six went into it and we only took three out and all of a sudden they're not the same. So if they aren't exactly the same, say, is there anything more I could have taken out? Maybe you didn't take everything out you could have. All right. But once these are the same, that's one part of your answer, 5x minus 4. And the greatest common factor pieces we took out is also a binomial x plus 3 is your second factor. Once again, notice there's a multiplication between those parentheses. So the common binomial is factor 1. The greatest common factor we took out in a parentheses is factor 2. These should be multiplied together. That is our factor form. The only quicker way to do that problem is just to look at it and write the answer. If you get to that point, good job. All right. Wait, we can do that still. Can you? We can get x minus 4 and x those plus are the 15. Same thing. Uh, x minus 4 and x plus 15, if we did that. Can you just leave it like that? Well, hold on. So, what Reed's asking is if we get this thing here and we do this, look kind of like we did in the first problem. Again, our factored form is supposed to equal the original expression, right? If we try this out, x times x makes x squared. That makes plus 15x. That makes minus 4x. And that makes minus 60. All right. This makes the positive 11x in the middle, but these guys are different, so that's not equivalent. So the chart, it's the same looking chart, but we're using the information a different way. When it's just 1x, we do what you want to do there, Reed. When it's like example problem 1, we're going to just, what the numbers are, that's ready to go. But when it's something x squared, not 1x squared, then you have to take that to break these down to do the factor by grouping. There's no way to avoid it. Again, the only other way to do this problem, a problem like this, is just to look at it and write the answer down. And that's just because you've done so many, it's just that easy. And you guys haven't done that many yet, so probably isn't that just that easy. So this would be the technique that would get you to the right answer more often than not. Moving on to number three. Okay, simplify negative three plus five i minus two minus ten i, write the answer in a plus b i form. I am gonna be picky about the form, make sure this is real plus imaginary order, always real plus imaginary order, never ever anything else other than that. That's the order I want final answers in. Mr. Clark, what? isn't i cubed uh, one? i cubed is negative i. Oh, negative i, never mind. Yeah. So your, your power, and this, is, this isn't happening on this because we're just adding subtracting, so we're not getting any powers on it. Mm -hmm. But if I did deal with the powers of i, you got i to the first is i, i to the second is negative one, i to the third is negative i, and i to the fourth is positive one. That's your, your pattern for i's, and then i to the fifth just repeats the pattern, you're back to i to the first again, because i to the fourth times i, i to the fourth is one, so the, every time you get four powers of i, it creates one, they go away. So, anyway, but that's, that's your thing, and the mnemonic device to memorize it, i1, i1, put the minuses in the middle. Okay, so, anyway. Um, here we're just simplifying a subtraction problem. It could be an addition problem. It's just plus or minus. So object one plus or minus object two. In this case is minus object two. So negative three plus five i has a parentheses around it just for effect. It's, it's saying this is a, my first complex number I want to look at. That's why the parentheses are there. There's nothing being multiplied or done to it except for just a positive sign. So really those parentheses are effectable parentheses. The second parentheses has a minus sign in front of it, but that minus sign must distribute through the parentheses. So I'm going to get minus the first thing, so minus 2. I'm going to get minus the second thing, I'm going to get minus minus 10i, which is plus 10i. So the first thing I'm going to do a problem like number 3 is I'm going to rewrite it with no parentheses correctly. Minus is in front, must distribute, plus is in front, just drop the parentheses off. So again, this has nothing in front, so officially a plus in front, the parentheses just dropped off. This one has a minus in front, so minus the first thing, minus, minus, makes plus the second thing. Then it's just adding like terms. Negative 3 plus negative 2, they're both negative, so I add. 3 is bigger, so it's negative. There's my real answer. 5i and 10i are both imaginary numbers. They're both positive, so I add them together, you get 15i and 10 is bigger, so it's positive. Wouldn't it be squared? Nope. Or no, nope. You're adding? And when you're adding, powers don't change. Okay. okay. Oh, 
Everybody here at home hear that too? When you're adding powers don't change. Uh, think of your counting things. I have five dogs and ten dogs, so I have fifteen dogs, I don't have fifteen dogs squared. When, when it seems ridiculous with real objects, then it seems ridiculous with letters, right? Now, that's the problem with algebra. Things don't seem ridiculous unless you kind of put it into real context like that. So adding objects, you're just going to get more of that object. You're not going to get an object squared. So adding eyes, you're not going to get an eye squared out of it. That's the best way to kind of know whether or not to change powers or not. All right, number four. I'm going to write a complex fraction in A plus BI form. Oh, real quick. Real A plus imaginary BI. Again, first real, second imaginary every time. Always write your final answers for these in that order. Real first, the I term second. Um, the problem with a rational complex number is we don't want I on the bottom. Alright, so the bottom is currently 2 plus 3I, so I have 8 minus 5I on top. I have 2 plus 3I on the bottom. I do not want an I on the bottom, and the fix to get rid of an I on the denominator of a fraction is the conjugate of that complex number. So I rewrite this exact thing just exactly like it is, except I put a minus in the middle. Same two objects, opposite sign in the middle. And fraction world says if I multiply the bottom of a fraction by anything, I'm going to multiply the top by the same thing. Okay. The top is a binomial, the bottom is a binomial, so I'm going to encase those in parentheses. I'm multiplying both top and bottom by another binomial, so I've got FOIL going on at both top and bottom. FOIL is just another way to multiply both of these things times both of those things. I can just do a straight distributed property also. It looks like this. I'm taking 8 times both of these things. So on top, I've got 8 times 2 is 16. 8 times negative 3i is negative 24i. Then I take negative 5i times both of these things. Negative 5i times 2 is negative 10i. Negative 5i times negative 3i is positive 15i squared. And when you're multiplying letters, that's when powers change. So i times i makes i squared there. But again, that's all FOIL does anyway. This is just a fancier distributed property. But 8 times both things, negative 5i times both things, you get a total of four products down here. On the bottom, if I do the same thing, I take positive 2 times both things. 2 times 2 is positive 4. 2 times negative 3i is negative 6i. I take positive 3i times both things. Positive 3i times 2 is positive 6i. Positive 3i times negative 3i squared makes negative 9. I'm sorry. Negative, positive 3i times negative 3i makes negative 9i squared. I said an extra square in there by accident. So positive 3i, negative 3i, negative 9i squared. Now, the thing to consider when you do all this multiplication is you're going to get some i squared objects in here. And I just on the last sheet, we just said i squared equals negative 1, right? Usually when you're simplifying this type of thing, you're going to hit i squared. You're not going to get higher powers than that. So i squared is the, the more common one to see. So if we just focus on i squared, what does multiply by negative 1 do to something? Changes the, Changes the sign to its opposite, right? Negative becomes positive, positive becomes negative. Whatever sign it is, it becomes its opposite. So when I have an object that has i squared on it, i squared being negative 1, positive 15 i squared is simply negative 15. i squared is the real number negative 1. Negative 1 times positive 15 is negative 15. So I can do the replacement and the evaluation all in one fell swoop like that. A positive i squared term becomes negative real. A negative i squared term, negative 9 i squared, becomes positive real. Or you can do the whole substitution. Put a negative 1 in, multiply it out. But again, plus 15 i squared just means minus 15. Minus 9 i squared just means plus 9. The i squared makes negative 1. i squared makes negative 1, and the multiplication of the negative changes the sign to a positive. So we get the real object with the opposite sign. The other things happening on the bottom specifically is we always get opposites here. The inside and outside products always cancel, so those go away. So the i's cancel each other out. This i squared becomes real, so everything on the bottom is now real. 
that whole process multiplied by the conjugate makes that happen. We always get opposite eyes, so they go away. We always get I squared, that becomes real. Everything's real, that's what our goal was. So on the bottom, I calculate what I have. Four plus nine makes 13. On the top, sometimes things cancel, sometimes they don't. Whatever happens, happens, I don't care. Just so long as the bottom becomes a nice, pretty, real number like 13 or 7 or 22 or negative 5, whatever it is, it is. All right? As long as it's real, I'm good. On top, 16 minus 15 is positive 1. Signs are different. I've subtracted. 16 is bigger. It's positive. Negative 24i minus 10i. Those signs are the same, so I add 34i. They're both negative, so it's negative. And then, and then I want you to separate it. I want you to separate it then. So good A plus B I form means there's a real number and imaginary number. So I'm going to go 1 13 minus 34 I over 13. Where'd you get, where'd you get 1 from? Positive 16 minus 15. Okay, again, you're, you're always going to get two reals and two imaginaries on top, two reals, two imaginaries on the bottom after you get the I squares taken care of. The imaginaries on the bottom are always going to cancel if you did it right. So on the bottom, you just basically have two reels to deal with because the imaginaries go away. But on top, you typically have two reels and two imaginaries. You've got to deal with both. So there's my reels, and there's my imaginaries. Okay. It's not super difficult to do this process. There are a couple of sticking points that mess people up. Sometimes people get the wrong signs on these things. Sometimes they do plus instead of minus, and then we don't get this cancellation and weird things happen, so stuff like that. So be cautious that you do use the conjugate, whatever that is, change the sign. You carry out the multiplication correctly, you add when you're supposed to add, subtract when you're supposed to subtract, those types of things. Practice the skill, get good at it, and you should be fine. Moving on to five. Solve. All right, so there's number five solve, number six solve, number seven solve. All right, so all three of these problems you can do completing the square if you feel like it. It works every single time. So if you want to learn one way to do a problem, completing the square works every single time. With that being said, factoring is quicker if you can see it. So I'm looking always to factor first. If I can factor this thing, I want to do it that way. Factoring is easier if I can do it. If there's a 1 in front of the x squared, what do I look for for factoring? I need numbers to do what and what? Multiply to Multiply to make positive 30, and they also add to make positive 17, right? So we multiply to make this, they add to make that. This is for the factoring step. What two numbers multiply to make 30, add to make positive 17? 5 and no. 5 and 6 would be 11, not 17, but that would make 30. 15. 15 and 2. 2. 15 times 2 is 30. 15 plus 2 is 17, right? So again, just kind of think through it. If, if you can figure it out, great. If not, then it probably doesn't factor, all right? So... Factoring works sometimes, completing the square works every time, but again, if factoring works, it's quicker. So, 2 and 15 multiply to make 30, 2 and 15 add to make 17, which means the factor form of this expression here, this whole thing here, on the left-hand side of the equal sign is going to be parentheses, x plus 2, parentheses, x plus 15, and that's going to equal 0 still. The difference between problem 1 and problem 5, problem 1 said factor, we were done when we factored it. Problem 5 says solve, we want to find the answers to the problem. All right. So, once we factored it, set it equal to 0, the zero product property states this. A product, two things multiplied that equals 0, means that either the first thing, x plus 2 equals 0, or the second thing, x plus 15 must equal 0. That's what the zero product property states. If things are being multiplied, the product is zero, zero must be multiplied. So zero times anything equals zero, zero times anything equals zero. So just set each factor individually equal to zero, and then work out those problems. Chop the two, move it over. Chop the 15, move it over. X equals negative two, and X equals negative 15. I did it the long, hard way. Oh the complete the square way? Did you get negative 2 and negative 15? Yeah, but I did it a longer way. That's fine. That, oh. that's uh, if you completed the square and got negative 2 and negative 15, that means you're completing the square quite well, so that's good. Good practice. But again, look for factoring first. Factoring is easier if it works. All right. All right. If it, if, uh, my my um, time limit for me is 10 seconds. If I can't factor it in 10 seconds, I move on the other way.
You guys might need 15, 20 seconds factor, I don't know. But like just a 1x squared type thing, um, factoring is quicker if it does it. But again, if you can't figure out a factored form within 10 to 15 seconds, it probably doesn't factor. So then go on to completing the square because that'll get you all the, all the answers, even all the ugly ones with 7 plus or minus the square root of 23 and those types of things. Because those wouldn't factor. Right? Everybody good with the factoring one there? Yeah. All right, moving on to number six. Notice, first off, we're solving a quadratic equation that does not equal zero. And again, our first priority in a quadratic equation is everything equals zero. I like x squared to be positive, so I'm going to move the 8x to the left. So x squared minus 8x plus 18 is equal to zero. And again, it kind of has the exact same structure number five did, right? So we're looking for numbers multiply to make a positive 18 that add to make negative 8. And if we try the list, and I'm just going to, I'll just deal with positives. 1 times 18 is 18, they add, add up to 19, right? Uh, 2 times 9 adds up to 11. 3 times 6 adds up to 9. And I ran out of numbers, right? So I can't multiply to make this and add to make that. So this one right here does not factor. So again, when I get one that does not factor, now I have to complete the square. I don't have a choice in the matter. This will not factor. Completing the square is the only way, as of right now, that you guys know how to do this. We will be learning other techniques down the road you might like better. But right now, completing the square is the method. So step one, complete the square. Get it looking like this. Step two, divide by a. Don't have an a, so move on. Step three, move the constant. So it's going to be x squared minus 8x. Leave a gap equals negative 18. So when we're completing the square, we should get our problem looking like this. 1x squared, something x, gap equals number. Every single time we get to this point, the complete the square step is a matter of taking half of 8, which is what? 4. And squaring that, 4 squared is? 16. 16. So we're going to get plus 16 on this side. We're going to get plus 16 on this side. Okay? There is only one number in the entire world that will work, and that's the number, 16. Plus 16 to both sides. And again, that's exactly half of 8, 4 squared. So 4 squared 16, that's where the 16 came from. I didn't just pull it out of the air. There's an actual rule to find it. All right? It is always plus, even though 8's negative, doesn't matter. Negative 4 times negative 4 is still positive 16. So when I do the half of b, I don't even worry about the sign. I just do half of b is 4, 4 squared 16, add 16 to both sides. Next step is to factor the left-hand side. We always create a binomial squared structure to factor the left, and we're going to take the square root of the perfect squares. So the square root of x squared is x. The square root of positive 16 is 4. And we take the sine of whatever the middle term is goes in the middle. Over on the right-hand side, we add up the two numbers we're looking at algebraically. If the signs match, we add. If they're different, we subtract. Take the sign of the bigger number. These signs are different, we subtract. 18 is bigger, so it's negative. This is another place to we get place we get to every single time we complete the square. Something squared equals something. So the last two steps are square root both sides. So I'm going to take the square root of the left and the square root of the right. Plus or minus goes on the right. Square rooting a perfect square just gets you whatever is being squared. So this square and this square root undo each other. X minus 4 is left on the left-hand side. Plus or minus the square root of negative 2. Keep in mind a minus sign in the radical creates an imaginary. So I'm going to at least do that much. Square root of 2 is a prime number. I can't make square root of 2 any prettier than that. So it will stay the square root of 2. So why is there an i there? Because the minus sign inside. If you have a minus inside a square root symbol, you're going to get an i outside the square root symbol. Okay. That's i's definition. i equals the square root of negative 1. So if you get a minus in the radical, that creates the i. All right? And finally, last step. So again, square root both sides to get here. Last step, we're going to slide whatever is with x over to the other side in front of the plus or minus. Change it, sign when you do it. So x becomes positive 4 plus or minus i times the square root of 2. And that's that answer. And again, I could not factor that problem. The two numbers that multiply to make a positive 18 that add to make negative 8 are 4 plus the square root of 2i and 4 minus the square root of 2i. Who's going to guess that? Not me. Right? So, again, you just you can't do it. So, that's, that's how you do it. There's no other way to do it. All right? Number seven. Once again, factoring is an option. 
there is a number in front of x squared. The completing the square process with that is challenging, right? Gets all those fractions involved. The factoring create, uh, requires factoring by grouping if we can get it to factor. For me personally, again, if I can factor it, I'm going to do it that way. So I'm looking at this problem, and I'm looking to see if I can factor it or not. I'm going to be looking at this guy multiplied by this guy. So I'm looking for factors of negative 42, and I want the sum of those factors to be negative 19. So um, 1 times 42, I'll make 42 negative. 2 times negative 21, and there it is right there, right? I multiplied 3 and negative 14. Anytime there's a number in front of x squared, you multiply the first and last numbers to get the factors of number. And then again, I just tried one times something, two times something, and keep going until you find the right pair or you decide it's not factorable. If this happened to say, let's say it said 23x, well, we skipped 23, right? Negative 41, negative 19. It won't be factorable, then we'll have to go ahead and go to the whole completing the square technique. But once I see that I do have a pair of numbers that works, again, what I do with these two numbers here is I modify this one term here. So I'm going to have positive 3x squared. I'm going to have a minus 14. I'm going to have an equals 0. All right? Equals 0 is just going to keep on coming along until we need to worry about it. Uh, I'm changing negative 19x into negative 21x plus 2x. And again, either order, going back to what Alicia asked about earlier, but term one, term two, term three. If term three can be positive, it's worthwhile. It's easier, so it's worth doing. So again, two x minus 21 x is right, but this is easier. <coughs> I'm gonna group, first two group together, last two group together. I'm looking for common factors. What goes into both three x squared and 21 x? Three. Three and? Seven. No, three and? X. X, right? And you want to take everything out you possibly can. 3 is common numerically. X is in both objects. So 3X squared divided by 3X makes X. Negative 21X divided by 3X is minus 7. Second group, what's common to 2X and 14? 2 goes into both things, right? 2 goes into 2X, 2 goes into 14. So plus 2, parentheses. 2X divided by 2 is X. Negative 14 divided by 2 is minus 7. And again, factor by grouping is successful when this object matches that object. That's one factor. And whatever the common factors are, 3x plus 2 is the other factor. And that whole thing still equals 0. So how did you get x again? You divided? This x here? Divided 2 by yeah. x. So, yeah, 2x divided by 2 makes x. 3x squared divided by 3x makes x. So, you're, whatever you're pulling out of that expression, that, that binomial right there, you're going to be dividing terms by it. So, the x squared divided by x makes x. This x divided by x canceled out, leaving us just with a number, right? And over here, 2x divided by 2 made x, and 14 divided by 2 made 7. So, once you see 2 is common, you're going to pull 2 out, and you divide by it. You see 3x is common, you pull it out, and you divide by 3x. All right? And then once we get our factor form equal to zero, now we still have to solve the equation. We're back to a factor form equals zero. So either x minus 7 equals zero, this is factor one, or 3x plus 2 equals zero, that's factor two. A product equals zero, we're multiplying by zero, so either one of those factors could be zero. So if x minus 7 equals zero, I chop the minus 7 becomes plus 7x equals 7 as an answer. 3x plus 2 equals 0. I chop the 2, make it negative. So 3x equals negative 2. I divide by 3. I get x equals negative 2 thirds. So my answers are positive 7 and negative 2 thirds. Completing the square would have gotten me the exact same answers, but then you've got to deal with all the fractions and the completing the square process. Um, I will make the problem like this on the test factorable, but if you're uncomfortable with the factoring technique, then practice your completing the square technique. That will still work to get the same answers. Sometimes one's more cumbersome than the other, cumbersome than the other for our people. So again, take take your pick on which one you prefer and go with that one. I don't have time for eight or nine, so I'm going to record eight and nine during seventh period. I'm going to put both videos on Canvas um, during my plan period, eighth period today, so you'll be able to watch those tonight. 
Um, tomorrow in class, I'm going to have a nine problem practice test. Okay, I'm going to supply you guys at home with the same thing. I want everybody to try their best on this practice test and turn it in by the end of the day tomorrow. I prefer to have it from you guys during class time. You guys, whenever you have time to work on it, obviously. Um, but on, you guys are going to be here tomorrow, though, right? So everybody will take the practice test, whether you've been here or not. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be extra credit. It's not going to be credit. So if you get five problems done, turn it in, you get some extra credit. If you get one problem done, you get some extra credit. But one problem in 30 minutes, that's kind of sad. So try and get more than one problem done. Right. I don't expect everybody to get nine problems done. You have 30 minutes. Get as much done as you can within the class period, turn it in, and then that'll be that. Um, and the test itself, the quiz, is going to be next Tuesday. All right? Uh, keep turning in your homework, 2-5, day 2. I believe I said is due tomorrow, so make sure you have that done by tomorrow. 2-5, day one's already been due. Um, so hopefully you turn that in. I already went through my papers last night. So that's all I got.